Okay, so uh, we finished last week basically the subject of fish. There was one question I wanted to address that was uh, raised that we quoted the Rabbi Kiva Eger, who's quoting from the Gemara, Teisus, that you shouldn't drink water after fish. Some people asked what to do if in the Shabbos meal if a person doesn't drink wine or something else on the table. So it's actually very simple because the Seder, as it's written, is to eat something parv and then drink something parv. So if you have some fish and then you have a piece of challah or eat something else parv, and then you drink some water, and so then that's not water after fish. Okay, so the new subject we're starting is that of um, meat. And it's important for a number of reasons that uh, in order for all of us to, uh, to understand what type of meat we're buying, what goes into it, why is it so expensive? I uh, can't answer all of that, but part of it, why is it more expensive than non-kosher meat, for example? That's pretty easy to understand. And the more people understand about it, um, the better they can explain it to others as well when it's, you're speaking to other people about kashrus, and especially today when there's so many challenges in the non-Jewish world uh, trying to prohibit or limit shechita, and it's important to understand what exactly goes uh, goes into it. So what we're going to do, I'll give a, just a short introduction, the Sefer Ikrim, it's a very famous book of uh, Jewish thought, and he explains why it is when the world was created that Adam and Chava were not allowed to eat meat. Doesn't it seem from that 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 was an ideal circumstance for the universe to function? Why was it changed later on? And he gives a very, very fascinating answer, which actually strikes so true that uh, it's, it's almost like a prophecy. He says that since people were not allowed to eat animals and the human um, human beings and animals were equal in that they only, only ate vegetation, so therefore the people considered them were just like animals. So they ended up killing people and killing animals as well because all life was on the same level. Um, so it's very fascinating in order to teach the sanctity of you of human life Hashem had to allow consumption of meat in order to teach us the difference between humans and animals the last two lines over say for say for to eliminate this from all of the all of civilization this whole idea of equality that human beings and animals are equivalent and it's very striking. Many of the places, they're very, very uh, insistent about uh, animals' uh, rights and animal pain, which is also a value in the Torah and an important value of the Torah. It's prohibited to cause unnecessary pain to an animal. But on the other hand, the same civilizations are allowing abortion and euthanasia and all sorts of loss of human life, um, which is obviously not consistent with that. Okay, I'd like to give first a general introduction because the things we've learned previously um, all are really taking place in the home, more or less. But when you talk about meat, since people are not actually producing the meat in their own home, so we're really in the field of industrial kashros. So there are a few things which are relevant, obviously, to the supervision, production of kosher meat, but really to all kosher production in general. So when you are eating something and you didn't cook it yourself from the raw ingredients that you know are fine, who are you relying on and, and what are you relying on? So first of all, you have the Rabbah Machsher. Who is standing behind this Hechsher? So you have a person who's a Rabbah Machsher and you're keeping according to the standards of this Rabbah Machsher or the Kashus organization, the Rabbah Machsher who's behind the Kashus organization, that's critical person number one. But that person is not sufficient. This person needs staff. So there's Kashus staff, there's Mashkechim. When talking about meat, we're talking about Shachtim and uh, other, uh, other uh, vitally important people along the line. So there's Kashus staff. And then there's support staff. Today, in order to run things at a far distance, 
There's all sorts of logistics that come into the picture when you're dealing with ingredients, especially there's a, a need to keep track of things. It's often impossible to do without a computer and a database and people that are capable of running it. Uh, and you can have the best Rav HaMachshar in the world, and if he doesn't have the staff behind him, I was once uh, involved in a case where there was a very fine a fine Rav HaMachshar, a big Yerushalayim and everything. He told me he had the Mashkiach, who was a big Yerushalayim. We needed int- information about a certain product, and we had to call, uh, call the Mashkiach. And... Uh, and uh, he was a very fine person, and I asked him a question, what was it, uh, the big, can you give me the code number, and what's the country of origin? And he told me in Yiddish, the only problem is I don't know how to read English. So he's a very fine mashkiach for many, many things, but not if you need to read the code number on a big. Um, now, all of these people, especially the Rav Maksha, obviously needs halachic knowledge, book knowledge, but that's not enough, you need practical knowledge, in order to know what actually happens in the real world when these things are happening, especially in an industrial setting. And then you need practical experience to actually see what sort of things come up in in a modern day industrial uh, production. And then once a person has all of that, there's always new things to learn. The field is always developing. There are new things which are always happening and new challenges which are always coming up. So once you have all of this, then the, the Rav HaMachshu and the Hechshu has certain standards. And that's really the crucial question people often ask. What's with this symbol? What's with that symbol? And it really breaks down to this issue. What are the standards? And even more importantly, or equally important, is how are they enforcing these standards? You're going to have the finest standards in the world, but if there's not a system to make sure that's being implemented, then uh, the standards uh, are not reflecting the reality. Okay, so that's general. That's not uh, specific to meat, although in certain areas might be more crucial when it comes to to meat than other sorts of production. But it's in all sorts of cautious um, production now. So I'm going to give a general introduction first and go through all the stages of what it takes to get this meat from an animal that's uh, alive and walking around till you buy it in the package. Okay, and so first I'm going to give a general overview of what is the halachic necessity for all of these steps. And we're just going to go through the whole picture quickly and then we'll go through one at a time and the different uh, factors that influence each one. So first of all, we have to make sure it's a kosher species, okay? So you have to make sure, we were talking before about fish, to how to identify a kosher fish. So this is something that today the consumer is not taken care of. So I'm I'm not going to really go into it. Um, Just to mention that uh, today it's become more and more complicated. There are issues in genetic engineering and what sort of species. A few years ago there was a whole um, controversy about what species of chickens were kosher. It's well known that there are different types of ducks that are kosher. When I was learning Shechita, I learned by Rabbi Kalman Sanalava Shalem, and he took us through in Pitkin, uh, the Pitkin Avenue, the market there, took us through and showed us this type of duck is kosher, this type of duck is not kosher. We were students when we were practicing, so we could, you're not allowed to practice on a non-kosher species. And there was a type of very strange looking black skinny chicken with this bony head that uh, all the Haitians were buying, and he told us we're not allowed to shech them. We don't have a Maseda, we don't have a tradition that that's a kosher species. And uh, today things have become more complicated. They genetically engineered a chicken without feathers in Israel, all different sorts of things that are happening, but uh, I'm not really going to go into that any more than I just did. Now, the f- I'm going to give on the left-hand column what's the halachic issue that has to be solved, and then on the right-hand column, what is the halachic procedure in order to take care of that? But before I start, I'd just like to mention that when it comes to, to meat, aside from the fact that it has this tremendous potential, you have an- energy from a much higher place. We have inanimate and uh, plant life and animal life and, and human life. So we're dealing with a very, very high intense form of, 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 of life force and soul in comparison with the other things uh, that we eat. But from a logic point of view, you're starting with something which is 100% prohibited until you do something to it. 
not only is it 100% prohibited, we have a number of prohibitions, else we'll see, before you can consume it. But it's sort of like uh, getting a, a closed box and, and there's a surprise. You have no way of telling, even after you're sure that it's a kosher species, whether it's going to be kosher in the end or not. Maybe it's going to end up being non-kosher somewhere along the line. So with certain things are certainly non-kosher about it, but other things, we don't even know whether we have the ability to make this animal or bird, whatever it is, whether we're able to make it kosher. So it has a chazaka, has a halachic presumption before we bring it out of its non-kosher state. We don't normally bring non-kosher things into our world, but here is something which is 100% not kosher until we take care of the various halachic prohibitions. So we'll go through them one at a time. First of all, since it's a live animal, we have a prohibition of Eber Minachai. You're not allowed to eat, eat any meat or a limb or any meat which is taken from a living animal. So the animal is now alive. You cannot consume its meat. It's even prohibited under the seven Noahide commandments. Even if it died by itself, then it's called an Avela. So when we say that there's meat in the supermarket, for example, that's, uh, that's the non-kosher meat, and, uh, and people say it's trefa, well, it might be trefa, but it's for sure nevela. Nevela means an animal that died in any way other than kosher shechita. And that's the solution for both of those uh, uh, issues. Both of those prohibitions is kosher shechita. So if there is a nick in the knife, we'll be speaking about chalafim. I just took out my... Uh, my chicken chalif over here. So here you, you have a chalif. There's a very, very uh, almost un, undetectable blemish on this knife. And since the, the animal was shechted in an improper fashion, so it's, it ends up being prohibited as an avela. Once it's no longer alive, it's not even menachai anymore, but it still has not been shechted properly and it's prohibited as, uh, as, as an avela. The next issue to contend with after that is trefa. So in, uh, in 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 speech, people speak about uh, you know trefa cheese or something of that sort. You could actually you could have trefa cheese, but let's say uh, something else which is uh, which is treif. So trefa is actually a technical term, and it speaks about an animal that was injured or diseased, and exactly what sort of injuries and diseases would render the animal a trefa is all part of the oral teta and it's an extensive area in uh, in Jewish law and the way to take care of that is through bedika. Now bedika we have many places in halacha, it just means checking. Yeah, bedika is a mezuzah, bedika. But over here you have to check the animal for disease. Which disease or which injury do you have to check for in which animal and under what conditions we'll be discussing later on. But just to give a, a, a just a rough number, it's not at all unusual that you would have a hundred a uh, hundred uh, 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 heads of cattle that were slaughtered, and eighty percent of them will be invalidated because they're trefa. It's not unusual at all. Only twenty out of the hundred end up being healthy enough that they're acceptable for kosher meat, and that's before you even start. Um, going to the next steps of making the meat kosher. So the bedika, the checking for disease, we'll be speaking about each of these steps individually. I just wanted to give first the overview. A third, and really a third and fourth prohibition is the prohibition of fat and the prohibition of blood. Chelev is uh, is forbidden fat. There are, uh, in halachic terms, there's two types of fat. There's chelev and there's shuman. Shuman is kosher fat and chelev is non-kosher fat. And uh, the blood is... Is, is prohibited. You have blood in the veins and you have blood in the flesh. So the third step of preparing this meat in order should be consumed is called nikur, trever in, in, in Yiddish, and that's taking out the, the forbidden fats from the animal and taking out the blood, primarily any veins that would not be taken out through, through salting. And uh, just to mention that when it comes to the seriousness of the prohibition, both chelev and dam are prohibited by by kares. The punishment is, is kares, the very, very uh, severe, uh, shows on the severity of the prohibition, even if the 
the shechita was perfect and the bedika, there's, not, there's no trefus whatsoever eating the, the, some of the fat or the blood uh, from uh, even a kosher animal. That's what uh, we started now, say for Vayikra, it's offered on the, on the altar. And uh, the last step is to take the blood out of the flesh itself, and that's normally done through malicha, through salting the meat. This is not an optional step. The meat is still not kosher. Now, the meat technically is kosher, but the blood in the meat is not kosher, so you have to get the blood out of the meat. And normally that's done through malicha, through salting. Uh, there's certain things such as liver, that salting is ineffective to remove all of the blood, and they have to be broiled, but we'll be speaking about that. Uh, later on. And then another equally important step, after you did this whole thing, you end up with a piece of kosher meat. Congratulations, you went through all this all this proper stages and now you're left with a pre- piece of kosher meat. But you have no way of telling whether it's kosher or not from looking at it. The only one that knows that it's a kosher piece of meat is the mashkiach, is the, is the, the people that are working over there to ensure that it's kosher. So therefore, it has to be labeled properly and sealed properly. And when it comes to meat, we need two seals that cannot be tampered with any time that it's out of the sight and control of, uh, of uh, the, the, the sheikh, the mashkiah, whoever it is that's in charge of this particular, uh, this particular load. Now, you could put a lock and a seal on the entire room, that would also be sufficient. You don't have to do it to every single piece. But until it gets down to the retail level where a person is actually going to be buying it and consuming it, this is an essential and often, unfortunately, overlooked part of the, of the process. And I, and I feel it necessary to mention that there have been major, major scandals in the cashless age, uh, world in general, and in the field of kosher meat in particular, and almost all of them have been in this last point of seals and labels. So when the famous Muncie meat scandal happened, that was somebody that was just changing the, the labeling and taking non-kosher um, pieces of meat and just repackaging them um, dishonestly with a with a kosher symbol on it. In, in California, they had also a place over there, and the person was saving old boxes of kosher meat. And instead of throwing them out, he would save it and, and buy non-kosher meat and throw it in the kosher boxes. The biggest scandal that ever happened in the entire kosher world happened with a with a chicken factory in, in in the Midwest of the United States, it was under the OU. Then the the, the Shailat scandal, where it was actually found by a by an accountant who said that the numbers in this factory don't add up. And he went to the attorney general. He didn't go to the rabbanim. He went to the attorney general because if if they were let's say pr- supposed to be producing two hundred thousand chickens a week, but he saw that the the amount going through money-wise was was double that, and it turned out that they had a separate factory where there were no shachtim, there was no shechita going on, no malicha going on, everything was 100% non-kosher, but he went to the place, they used to use plumbus, plumbus is uh, the word for lead, they used to have this lead, maybe some people here still remember, on the chicken, on the wings, they used to put these lead, maybe you have it, some places still do it, they put the lead uh, clips, to identify them as kosher, and they're made in such a way that when you remove it, they automatically break and you can't put it on something else so they can't be recycled. Uh, here in Montreal, we use plastic, but whatever the case is, uh, he just, uh, the owner of the, uh, of the enterprise just went to the one that made these, and he just printed an extra 200,000 or whatever the number was per week, and um, Throughout the United States, there are people that have to kosher their entire um, kitchen. So this issue of labeling, I wish I could say that the problem has been solved 100%, but it's something which is extremely important. And this is way after the sheikh had finished his job a long time ago. He has nothing at all to do with it. This is the job of the Rav Machsher to ensure that everything that's being, that's coming out to the consumer is, uh, is, is properly supervised.
So we'll stop here.